she understands, evaluates herself uh, and her life, her whole existence is against the measure of achievement that her parents present for her. Sobre o que falar do ex-namorado Daniel Cravinhos e como se comportar diante da câmera. You'd think a child born into a rich family would be grateful for the start they get in life. They have all the financial support they need to build a successful academic career and if everything fails, they have a safety net to fall back on. But some rich kids grow so entitled that their families become nothing more than hurdles to them. Hurdles on the way to inheriting their wealth and doing as they please without someone breathing down their necks. These are the stories of three narcissistic, psychopathic teens who took out their entire families for outrageous reasons. Sobre o que falar do ex-namorado Daniel Cravinhos e como se comportar diante da câmera. Suzanne Louise von Richthofen would become one of the most fake, infuriating criminals in Brazil's history. But before all that, she was a promising young teenager in Sao Paulo, living with her rich, intellectual family. In the early 2000s, the von Richthofen family lived in a luxurious mansion with a library, a swimming pool, and rooms dedicated to entertainment for their two children. Manfred Albert von Richthofen was a successful engineer and the director of the Sao Paulo company, managing all the highways and roads leading out of the city. He had moved to Brazil from Germany as a student. And and it was at university that Manfred met his future wife, Mauricia. Mauricia went on to become a just as successful psychiatrist. Everyone who knew her said the same thing about her. She was kind, brave, and very fun to be around once you got close to her. On November 3rd, 1983, several years after they got married, Mauricia and Manfred had their first child, Suzanne. Four years later came a boy named Andreas. Both kids went on to attend private schools. They had bright careers ahead, everyone was certain. Their family offered not just the financial support, but the care and attention that any child needs to become successful later in life. And by all accounts, Suzanne and Andreas did flourish under their parents' care. They were straight-A students with lots of hobbies and excellent behavior at school. Suzanne in particular was described as quite shy and soft-spoken. She wasn't the most popular girl in school, but she was in no way the rebel or the kind to start fights behind the school. By the time she graduated from high school, she was fluent in three languages and ready to study for a prestigious, high-earning career. Manfred and Mauricia were proud of her. After all, they wanted their children to pursue high-paying jobs and make their own money too, even if they each had some $30 million in the bank. Indeed, the von Richthofens had a huge net worth, and reportedly, Manfred had another $10 million embezzled in a Swiss bank account. Also reportedly, this would have been Suzanne's after she finished her bachelor's studies. The account was in her name. All she had to do was focus on her studies and be patient. But Suzanne wasn't going to take that easy route. In fact, things were about to take a very dark turn. As it goes in stories like these, those that sound too good to be true, Suzanne met a man that her family didn't want around her. It all started when her little brother, Andreas, developed a passion for model airplanes. At an airplane fair in 1999, the family met a 19-year-old boy named Daniel. He was three years older than Suzanne and a passionate model airplane builder just like her brother. Andrea saw Daniel as a role model, and he begged his parents to invite Daniel to their home to teach him how to build more airplane models. Soon enough, Daniel had a different motive for visiting the Von Richthofen's house, Suzanne and her money. You see, Daniel had grown up together with his brother, Christian, in a seriously low-income household. They had both dropped out of high school, and they were working as mechanics. Well, that was on paper. Most of the time, they smoked and got in trouble. When she started dating Daniel, Suzanne knew her family wouldn't love their love story, so she kept it a secret for as long as she could. When her parents found out eventually, they didn't seem phased. They said it was okay. Daniel was an ambitious law student and a passionate model airplane builder after all. While Daniel did build a few model airplanes, he was never a college student. He had charmed his way into the rich Tofin's lives with lies and outrageous compliments. The minute he started dating Suzanne, he stopped going to work. He figured he was going to live off Suzanne's money forever. Shockingly, Suzanne did not see a problem in this. Some months into this charade, Manfred and Mauricia learned that Daniel was a compulsive liar. Understanding what he really did all day, they asked their daughter not to date him anymore. This is how many tragic family side cases start, with a teenager being denied a partner. 
Teenage romances can be intense, and it can be a symbol of the teen trying to affirm their independence. Take that away from them, and you can get disproportionate reactions. Still, no one could have prepared Manfred and Mauricia for what their daughter chose to do. First, Suzanne manipulated her little brother into covering for them. She would sneak out to motels and getaways with Daniel, all while Andreas concocted crazy stories for their parents. Then, in 2002, Manfred and Mauricia left their kids home alone while they went on a holiday to Europe. They hadn't been away on their own in years, and they figured Suzanne was old enough and responsible enough to be in charge of the house and take care of her younger brother. Except, it was the other way around. Andreas ended up keeping the house together while his sister did narcotics by the pool with Daniel. Daniel moved in with them for the entire month that the parents were away. The two behaved so outrageously that even her 15-year-old brother thought it was too much. When Manfred and Mauricia got home, Andreas told them everything. The family fought through the night. Suzanne's parents wanted her to dump Daniel and rid herself of this bad influence. She was flunking classes and doing drugs, something she had never dreamt of before. Suzanne, on the other hand, had a suggestion that her dad buy her an apartment so she and Daniel could live happily ever after there. Manfred realized the situation was more dire than he imagined. His daughter was, in short, an entitled brat. So he told her she was free to do whatever she liked, including run away into the sunset with Daniel, as long as she covered the costs. He was not going to financially support this, nor was he going to give her an allowance anymore if she continued to hang out with Daniel. Many kids grow up without an allowance, and most kids grow up without $10 million waiting for them in a Swiss bank account. But Suzanne did not realize this. Instead, she started hating her parents and wishing them dead. One day, she hatched a plan and her boyfriend was happy to oblige. On November 1st, 2002, the Rich Tofen's neighbors heard screams from their house. It was Suzanne and Daniel. They had just returned home from a party where they discovered Manfred and Mauricia butchered beyond recognition. The emergency services were quickly called to the location, but the parents' lives could not be saved. The scene was so graphic, it had the officers retching. It also had officers wondering what exactly happened. There were lots of conflicting clues. On the one hand, this was a millionaire family, so home invasion was pretty likely. But the house had not been ransacked, just robbed of a few very precise valuables. This meant the robber knew exactly where to look. Other rooms were trashed, but no valuables were missing. Papers were thrown on the ground tidily, almost as if someone was trying to create a parody of a robbery. Then, the detectives learned that the family's alarm never went off or notified the guards stationed across the street. So whoever had entered the house had disarmed the alarm. Needless to say, this made the detectives weary of the Rich Tofen's immediate family, Suzanne and Andreas. Andreas was so shocked by what had happened that he went through several panic attacks throughout his first day. Heartbreakingly, he never fully recovered. He never had a successful career, and his mental health took a turn for the worse. In 2017, he broke into someone's home looking disheveled and claiming he did not want to live anymore. After this incident, he was admitted to a mental hospital, and it's unclear if he has ever been released. Suzanne, on the other hand, was much calmer, even hours after discovering her parents in the way that they were. When the detective spoke to Andreas, he told them what he and Suzanne had been doing the night before. Suzanne had snuck Andreas out of the house at around 9 p.m. the previous day. They went to a local party and Suzanne ran off to a motel with Daniel for a few hours. Then at 4 a.m., the siblings returned home only to find their parents gone. This was odd. Why would Suzanne want Andreas out of the house on the same night her parents were unalived? And Suzanne's behavior only got more questionable following this. Manfred and Mauricia were laid to rest around Suzanne's 19th birthday. But while most people were dressed soberly and crying, Suzanne showed up in a sexy outfit. She wanted the attention on her, not her parents. And three days after her parents were slain, Suzanne hosted a pool party. You guys, this is so typical for teenage killers. They really don't think ahead. Did Suzanne not realize that hosting a party would show her lack of empathy for her parents' passing? Then came an anonymous tip. A friend of the family phoned law enforcement with a strange piece of information. A young man named Christian Krevenhaus had just bought an expensive Suzuki motorcycle up front with $100 bills. This was Daniel's brother, the mechanic, who complained to everyone about how poor he was. How did he have this kind of money? 
And why did this happen just days after the von Richthofen's deaths? The bike was confiscated by authorities and Christian was interrogated. Within the hour, he cracked. Christian confessed to taking the von Richthofen's lives at Daniel and Suzanne's orders. Daniel and Suzanne's plan sounded enticing enough. Unalive Suzanne's parents and live off the 17 million euros they would inherit. Funny they never thought they would get arrested for such an obvious scheme. Suzanne and Daniel were in jail just days after the incident. Suzanne confessed, but refused to admit that money was a motive. She acted as though it was the real love between her and Daniel, hindered by a misunderstanding family. When Daniel confessed, he said of course it was money. He was going to live off Suzanne's parents' riches. This just goes to show the strength of their bond. This was not real love. It was a weak teenage romance with different goals and different worldviews. As soon as they were in handcuffs, Suzanne and Daniel broke it off. The case quickly made headlines all over Brazil, and people were outraged to hear how little empathy Suzanne still showed. What's worse, she was released on bail and allowed to walk free for four long years while she awaited her trial. During this time, Suzanne took the opportunity to give countless interviews in which she blamed Daniel and painted herself as a victim of his manipulation, an innocent bystander who had no choice but to do what Daniel said. It was all fake, just like Suzanne's love for her family. A few months into her tearjerker interviews, a cameraman filmed Suzanne's lawyer, instructing her to cry and say she felt guilt and remorse. Sobre o que falar do ex-namorado Daniel Cravinhos e como se comportar diante da câmera. By the time her trial began in July 2006, her lies had been exposed to the whole country. She still had no remorse for unaliving her parents. She only mourned her failed attempt to get her hands on her parents' money. During the trial, it was revealed that on the night of November 1st, Suzanne and Daniel did not sneak out to a motel. Instead, they left Andreas at the party and hurried back to Suzanne's home along with Christian. There, Suzanne checked on her parents to see if they were asleep. She gave the all clear and disabled the home alarm. Suzanne sat on the family couch downstairs while Daniel and Christian put on gloves and went upstairs armed with crowbars and hammers. When the couple refused to give in without a fight, the two brothers vacated them with towels and trash bags. Then they attempted to stage a robbery, quite dumbly so, and Daniel and Suzanne went to a hotel. Yeah, they did you know what minutes after offing Manfred and Mauricia. These three were nothing short of evil, and Suzanne's entitlement is truly repulsive. She never apologized for what she did. Until the very end of her sentencing, she insisted it was all Daniel's plan and that the two brothers were lying about her. On July 22nd, the three were found guilty of murder. Suzanne and Daniel were sentenced to 40 years in prison. Christian received 38 years behind bars. Suzanne never accepted her fate. She continued to appeal her sentence, citing personality disorders that led her to commit the heinous act, as if she did not know what she was doing. Thankfully, all of her appeals were rejected. Until she can show an ounce of remorse or admit to what she did, no judge will ever take her seriously. Distressingly enough, Suzanne will be released around her 60th birthday, and there's a fair chance she might still inherit her parents' money thanks to Brazilian laws. If that happens, is four decades behind bars a good enough punishment for her? 18-year-old Abdulia Sanchez filmed herself in her car with her sister, 14-year-old Jacqueline Sanchez. All fine and dandy, right? Nope, that day Abdulia crashed the car and took her sister's life, but she did not stop filming. Jacqueline was preparing for her 15th birthday while in the car with her sister. Abdulia, however, was live streaming. She needed to grow her follower base, she said, and she could multitask, except she couldn't. No one can, really. There's a reason for all the warnings not to text and drive. The human brain can't distribute focus to two simultaneous tasks. It can only switch from one to the other very fast. But when driving, this can prove deadly. It all happened in a matter of seconds. One minute, Abdulia was making grimaces at the camera, the next, she yelled in horror, and the video ended with a loud bang. She remained at the scene in utter shock until authorities arrived at the scene and placed her under arrest. When they tested her alcohol level, they discovered the sad truth. Abdulia was driving under the influence. That's even worse than simply thinking you can multitask. Abdulia seemed oblivious to the fact that she had another life on board. Her little sister was in her care that day, and yet she drank, drove, and live streamed. And here's the worst part. Abdulia carried on with her live stream even after seeing her sister destroyed. 
Her first reaction wasn't crying for her sister, it was explaining to her followers that she did not want to off her sister. Even seconds after it happened, her primary concern was covering for herself. Again, her problem was that she was going to jail, not that Jacqueline was gone. Throughout the entirety of her disgusting live stream, Abdulia keeps saying that this wasn't planned and makes sure that the internet doesn't perceive her as evil. But Abdulia did not realize that everyone who saw the live stream thought the stream itself made her evil. Who ever live streams their sibling's death? When she was arrested, Abdulia was asked why she did the live stream. Her answer was defensive. Everybody does it. Why not? People take videos of themselves in cars like all the time, and I'm only 18, we're still young. Why not? Your sister's death should provide an answer to that, just saying. Abdulia still didn't seem to show any remorse for her actions. She was taken to jail in Fresno and put on a $300,000 bail. When she spoke to the media again, she spoke about her public image again. I didn't even know I looked like a monster. Like, I look like a freaking horrible monster. That was not my intention at all. Again, this was all about herself. She was concerned with how she looked to the internet, not with what she had done. She was charged with drunk driving and vehicular manslaughter. But even that wasn't enough to make her apologize and do her time in peace. From prison, she made a public statement saying she live-streamed Jacqueline's death so she could get a proper burial. In short, she did it to raise some funds for her family. I made that video because I knew I had more than 5,000 followers. It was the only way my sister would get a decent burial. I would never expose my sister like that. Suddenly, she cared for her family and did the unthinkable for their sake. Then why didn't she say this when the detectives questioned her about it? No. This was a hero story designed to make her look good. She was too entitled to accept her fault and release an apology. Just like Suzanne, she never apologized for unaliving her sister. She only apologized for making the video offering a fake motive. Sorry for making that video. I look awful, but I accomplished my goal. I anticipated the public donating money because my family isn't rich. You guys, I'm pretty sure the public would have donated more if she had apologized and asked kindly for burial money. Abdulia pleaded not guilty. She was found guilty of DUI and manslaughter, nevertheless, and sentenced to six years and four months. Sounds like a short sentence for someone with so little remorse and so much annoying entitlement. Let's just hope she learns her lesson by the time she's released. On November 8th, 2010, a 24-year-old woman named Jennifer Pan woke up with a firearm to her head. A masked man dragged her out of her bedroom and tied her to the upstairs banister. She helplessly watched as her parents were dragged to the living room downstairs by two more hitmen, put against a wall and threatened with death. Jennifer told the man who tied her to get the $2,500 she earned from her piano lessons from her room. Another hitman found $1,100 hidden in Jennifer Mom's Beach's nightstand. Then the couple was ordered to stand up and one man threw a blanket over their heads. Five bangs were heard and both parents fell to the floor. Leisha's last words were, please let my daughter live. Moments later, Jennifer made a fateful 911 call. What's your name? My name is Jennifer. So it just broke in? So it broke in and I heard like pop. I don't know what's happening. I'm tied upstairs. Did it sound like any? I don't know what I could sound like. I just heard a pop. While the dispatcher was sending authorities Jennifer's way, she heard something terrible. It was a scream, but not a scream that sounded like someone was in physical pain. It was like someone was going through unspeakable emotional distress. Within inches of death, Jennifer's father, Han, had crawled into the driveway, screaming after seeing his wife die. He was sh in the head and fell into a coma shortly after he was rescued by paramedics. Amazingly, he would pull through and even help close the case. Initially, Jennifer was treated as a victim too, but there was something odd about her 911 call, something the dispatcher couldn't shake off, and something she had discussed with the officers later on. If Jennifer was tied to the banister, how on earth did she make the 911 call? And why would three hitmen leave a witness after what they'd done? And if they came to rob the house, why did they get away with $3,000 but not the two luxury cars in the driveway? 
As you might imagine, these were all questions the detectives had for Jennifer. I want to see how you could physically get your phone out of your waistband. We're obviously going to need to know that. It's very important. Jennifer told a series of implausible, conflicting stories where she managed to use her nose, tongue, or even untie one of her hands. Innocent people don't tend to change their stories. Plus, her behavior over the following week was distressingly calm. Her mother had been unalived in front of her, and her father was in a coma. Jennifer, the detective saw, should be more affected. Unfortunately for Jennifer, her father woke up from a coma, and he had a blood-chilling story to tell the detectives. Jennifer's parents, Bish Ha and Hui Han Pan, had come to Canada from the Chinese diaspora in Vietnam. They had worked hard to escape their impoverished and persecuted life back home, and they always told their children they should do the same. They wanted Jennifer and her younger brother Felix to get an education and a prestigious, high-paying job. Felix became a mechanical engineering undergrad at a top university in Canada. He was going to design cars. Jennifer, on the other hand, did not seem to follow in her parents' footsteps as eagerly. However, her parents did not know this until much too late. Growing up, Jennifer was just as academically gifted and hardworking as her brother. She learned piano and became an Olympic caliber figure skater during high school. Then she decided on her career too. His daughter, he wanted to be a doctor, eventually changing that to a pharmacist because he said that she didn't have the stomach for it. However, as she grew older, Jennifer found it increasingly hard to stay on top of her schoolwork, and she was too afraid of her strict, demanding parents to let them know. She's being given all the opportunities to succeed, but academically she's challenged. She can't actually meet those expectations. And as a result of that, and the fear of failing in a parent's eyes, she then begins to spin a web of deceit and lies. The more she dated and hung out with friends, the more Jennifer seemed to fail classes. That's when her lies got bigger. She started to forge her report cards and give herself, so she got, looks like she had straight A's. Um, and then once she was on that journey, that train, there was no getting off. Jennifer never enrolled to university, but her parents thought she did. She claimed to have a place at university. The university uh, declined to take her because she didn't match her entrance requirements. By the time she was 20, Jennifer had her parents convinced that she was a pharmacology student at the University of Toronto. She had even bought pharmacy books and left pharmacy videos open on her computer knowing her parents would check the screen when passing by. It did not stop there. A few years later, she claimed she graduated from that university, then lied to her family about getting the prestigious internship at the Children's Hospital. Jennifer became a role model for Felix and a subject for bragging at dinner parties for her parents. They would tell all their friends how proud of their daughter they were. They raised her to be ambitious and look at her go. They had no idea that in fact, Jennifer was working as a waitress and giving piano lessons to children. Side note, of course there is no shame in waitressing or teaching music, and it should not be seen as inferior to being a pharmacology student, but in Jennifer's universe, it was. Her family believed that a prestigious career was the only way to go for their children, and Jennifer was deeply caught up in pleasing them more than living a genuine life. So the only way that she understands, evaluates herself uh, and her life, her whole existence, is against the measure of achievement that her parents present for her. Without realizing it, Jennifer had become extremely stressed by her double life. She'd been doing it for a decade and she knew no other reality. The truth has a tendency to seep out, even when you work really hard to keep it hidden. When it eventually did, Jennifer's world crumbled. Jennifer's parents had grown increasingly suspicious that they'd never seen their daughter's hospital ID badge or uniform. Whenever they asked her about it, she would change the subject. So one day, her mom Bish followed her to work, only to see Jennifer chilling in a cafe for several hours. That's when she called the University of Toronto and learned her daughter had never been accepted to it. The same day, she phoned her high school, only to find out she never graduated. This led to a night-long fight where more truths came out. Basically, um, all hell broke loose at the family home. Her father apparently wanted to throw her out and was disgraced and everything else. Although Jennifer was in her early 20s, her relationship with her parents was that of a teen. She was lying about her life and lying in order to have a social life. You see, Jennifer's parents were, in all respects, quite overprotective of their daughter. They wanted Jennifer at home with them, seeing no boyfriends. But Jennifer was seeing someone, a man named Daniel Wong. Yep, 
Another boyfriend named Daniel, and just like in Suzanne's case, he really wasn't good news. It was clear that Jennifer loved Daniel from the way she spoke about him to her parents, but when they heard he was a pot dealer, they decided she could no longer date him. Now, considering Jennifer was 24 and her parents were forbidding her to date someone, it's easy to see why she chose to keep him a secret in the first place. It's usually highly critical and demanding parents that lead a child to lie. Children don't start lying for no reason. However, this case took a turn for the worse in a big way. And at this point, we cannot blame Jennifer's parents for more than doing what they believed was right for their daughter. Jennifer's family offered her two options, be disowned or do as they say and hold on to her family and inheritance. In order to choose the second option, Jennifer had to dump Daniel, focus on her studies, graduate from high school and enroll in pharmacology college. Until then, she was grounded like a young teen. She had a curfew and her parents were watching her every move. If she wanted to leave the house, she had to justify her exit and get her parents okay. Jennifer wanted to sneak out and meet Daniel, but it was very hard, and most of the time she ended up staying at home. A few months later, Daniel had some bad news for Jennifer. He had fallen in love with someone else. He wanted to break up with Jennifer. Needless to say, Jennifer was devastated, and she blamed her parents for it. If they would have allowed her to see Daniel, the relationship would have gone on, and he wouldn't have had the time to meet someone new. This really sent Jennifer into a bit of a depression over the kind of pressure she was getting from her parents and the kind of constraints she had on her life. Much like Suzanne, Jennifer wanted to have her cake and eat it too. And as she was used to spinning a full web of lies, Jennifer quickly devised another, much more dreadful scheme. First, she wrote to Daniel to let him know that his new girlfriend had sent a group of men to her home to essay her. Of course, this was a lie. Then she contacted Daniel again with an evil request. You see, when Hui Han woke up from the coma and spoke to the detectives, he did not know the full extent of what his daughter had done. But he had a hunch that she hated them for taking away her freedom and exposing her lies. And he suspected her of orchestrating their murders. Well, her mother's slang and her father's attempted murder. Hui Han did not know how Jennifer would do this. He was hoping it wasn't true, but he had to tell his theory to the detectives. It wasn't long before they confirmed his hunches. Jennifer was arrested on suspicion of murder and her phone was seized. She hadn't even tried deleting phone calls or messages. It was all there for the detectives. Jennifer had asked Daniel to put her in contact with three hitmen. It's shocking that Daniel would know such people in the first place, or that he would help Jennifer, knowing what she was about to do. But Daniel shared his contacts with Jennifer and she began her plan. She promised the hitman that after unaliving her parents, she would inherit $1 million and she would pay each of them $10,000 for the deed. They were taking two innocent lives for nothing more than a promise. Also, how did they think Jennifer would inherit the money before getting arrested? Did they really think her plan was that flawless? Neither of these people realized that by tying Jennifer to the banister to make it look like she was a victim, she wouldn't be able to call 911. It was a fake tie, of course, and the dispatcher saw right through this. When the detectives confronted her about it, she did not even have a straight story to tell. And when Daniel was arrested too, he confessed to everything. Daniel and two of the three hitmen were charged and put behind bars. Jennifer Pond was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. She was also given a court order banning her from any communication with her family for life. The court order was requested by her father and brother. Imagine having to live the rest of your life knowing your daughter unalived your wife and tried to take your life too. For Felix, recovering from this is just as hard. His sister used to be his role model. Now she is exposed as a horrible liar and evil person. It's reassuring to think that people like Suzanne, Obdelia, and Jennifer are in prison now. But how many more teens are meticulously planning to unalive their families right now? Can the red flags be seen and intercepted early on, or is it impossible to tell when you have a little monster under your roof? Yeah, I go back into the room and I tell them that I got the stuff, and so, after that, and then we drag my grandma into the bathroom, and... <clears throat> what was the reason for that? Just to bring her to the bathroom? Yeah, I don't know why we brought her back into the bathroom. I guess we didn't want to bring her into the bedroom, okay. so we just brought her into the bathroom. Um, and then, yeah, and then Johnny... And she, it was, was kind of creepy because she was like scared. 
Uh-huh. To die, like, she, she, she herself, herself. All this shit? It was kind of gross. This is 17 year old Cassandra B. George. Notice how callously she talks about killing her grandparents. She shows no remorse for her actions and even seems kind of proud of what she did. But however horrifying her crimes might sound, she's scarily not the only narcissistic teen killer. I do have three knives in my car. I usually carry one on me and I just grabbed it. What happened uh, after you took the knife? I once and didn't do anything and I again and it didn't do anything it was it was still being continued there was nothing that changed there's just we all know she'll be out in the community one day that's inevitable and what kind of person is she going to be what kind of adult is she going to be so those are the types of questions I I have so what did these girls do what were their motives and how did they think they would get away with it let's explore in this video on November 11th 2012 police in Sunbury responded to an incident where a man's body was found brutally murdered in a quiet residential neighborhood the man was identified as 42 year old Troy La Ferreira Troy was married and lived in Port Trenton Pennsylvania less than 20 minutes from where his body was found so what was he doing here his phone records showed that he had been chatting with an 18 year old woman named Miranda Barber who he'd met on Craigslist the two of them had planned to meet up that day, and he was killed for some secret rendezvous. Miranda, who already had a young daughter, had recently gotten married and moved to Pennsylvania. Three weeks after Troy's murder, Miranda was brought in for questioning. The reason you're here is there's a guy who was, was murdered, and his name is Troy LaFerra. You answered his ad on Craigslist, right? Yeah. What did his ad say? Um, it... <sighs> implied that you would be paid to go out with this person. Did it say, was it fully explicit? Or was it going to dinner? I mean, that, that would be spelled out in a Craigslist dinner. I mean, it was, yes, it was, but okay. I didn't go into it intending to do that. So you were gonna meet up with this guy, make a couple bucks. Yes. Miranda admitted that Troy had offered her money, but claimed that it was just for her company and nothing more. She also claimed that she and Troy never met the night that he was killed. Are you on the phone with him at all or talking to him? Okay. Message him? We, were, or? we were messaging back and forth, yes. Okay. We were just supposed to meet up at Denny's, but it never happened. Meeting never happened? Yes. Were you involved in, or do you have any knowledge of, the death of that guy, the death of Troy? No. We didn't just tonight decide, you know what, I want to go talk to Miranda. Mm -hmm. Something okay. happened and some information has come. I, I understand that, but you understand my that? goal right now is to get back to my daughter. Yeah. Our goal was to find the person who killed him. Yeah. Okay. And you're the last person on his phone. Actually, Miranda, we got to take your phone, put it in evidence, and then get a search warrant. Go that's not fair to me at all. That's what we have. I to have do. the right to walk away, walk out of here with all of my belongings, which not I'm going you, to do. With your phone. When she realized that the police were looking at her as a suspect, Miranda got extremely defensive. Hey, I'm very wrong. offended right now. I'm sorry. I you have. Understand. I have that. Yeah. I have time. I need numbers. I need my phone numbers. You understand? We have a job to do. I did not kill that man. I've never met that man in my life before. I hope not. I'm a single. I just got married. You guys are coming in my life, questioning me. I'm very offended. She probably thought that by being upset, the police would think that she was innocent and not insist at looking at her phone. But that's not what happened. In fact, the police were now even more suspicious of her. I want to go home to my baby who is screaming her head off, or me. We're your phone. Don't you touch me. Okay. I demand a little right, right now. Right. Don't, it's don't not, touch stop. me. No, stop. no, stop. I want, stop. stop. I didn't do anything! It's interesting how she thought that she was actually going to just storm out of the police station acting all offended, and the police would just let her walk. That quickly backfired. The police later brought in her husband, Elliot Barber, for questioning, and he repeated the same thing that Miranda had told him. I guess full honesty here, I've never heard of him, and I don't know anything about that, but the only thing I know is that 
what my wife does is meet with someone who's willing to like just pay you some money to have a nice conversation and sit down. It doesn't provide us anything, anything other than companionship because that, that's what they want. And if she was the last person he called, that, then that means that exactly that he was a potential client. He claimed that his wife was just offering men an ear to listen to, and that they would pay her for her delightful conversation and nothing more. But then some hours later, Miranda came back to the police station and told the police that she did actually meet up with Troy and jabbed him to death. But she claimed that it was in self-defense. I arranged to meet up with him, and I pulled at the mall, I saw him, he got in my car. Everything seemed fine. And as soon as I put the car in park, everything just completely flipped upside down. I didn't know what to do. He just attacked me. What was he doing to you? One hand was on my throat. Well, the other hand was trying, well, touching me down there. I do have three knives in my car. I usually carry one on me and I just grabbed it. What happened uh, after you took the knife? I once and it didn't do anything. And I again and it didn't do anything. It was, it was still being continued. There was nothing that changed. There was just Miranda said that she jabbed him over 20 times until he finally stopped. After that, she and Elliot dumped Troy's body before cleaning the car with bleach and then going to dinner at Red Robin. She then took Elliot out to a strip club for his birthday. But the police were not buying this story and knew that there was something more to it. So they interviewed Elliot again, and this time he told the truth. This guy was not looking for just companionship. He was looking for she misleadingly sold him through texts, but that was never the intention. The whole intention was to go. Now, yes, I knew she was going to meet him. Yes, I was with her. Yes, I did take part. I'm in the back seat, covered up by a blanket, and she's in the front. He gets in the car, probably around eight. So I pop up with that cord that y'all found on the body. That was me. Where do you have that cable at? Just right around the body. Around the throat. So on the night that Miranda went to meet up with Troy, Elliot was hiding under a blanket in the back seat, waiting. When Miranda gave him the signal, he jumped out and wrapped a cord around Troy's neck as Miranda attacked him with a knife. It was pretty good. The same. Uh, in between the, uh, the headpiece and the bottom is where I tried to angle it up underneath it and put my arm feet up against the back and pull it as hard as I could. She said she's in the groin. I think she said she's in the leg. The majority was it to the chest. She did say she's in the neck and like went through. And I look, lean forward, and she's just everything. And she's like, oh my god, I don't know what to do. The way this heartless monster is casually talking about viciously killing someone is really sick. It just shows his complete disregard for human life and makes me wonder how he would behave if he was the one going through the pain that Troy went through. Even more sickening, he didn't have a reason to do that. We just decided that we were gonna go. We had no reason, no anything else other than that. Yeah, disgusting. But this case would get even more bizarre. Out of nowhere, Miranda started talking about being a Satanist, claiming she had murdered over 20 people. As you would imagine, this blew up. She's a petite, baby-faced teen, now claiming to be one of the country's deadliest serial killers. 19-year-old newlywed and mother Miranda Barber could be facing the penalty for what police call a thrill kill. Miranda Barber already risks the penalty. Now, though, she's reportedly admitted killing a whole host of people across the United States as part of a satanic cult, saying, when I hit 22, I stopped counting. She claimed that she only killed bad people who did bad things and offered to take the FBI to the places she had hidden the bodies, saying, they're looking for full bodies. They won't find any, but they will find body parts. She claimed that she dumped some body parts in Big Lake, Alaska, and also in Mexico Beach, Florida, where she worked as 
as a 15-year-old go-go dancer. However, police could not find any evidence to support Miranda's claims and believe that she was just lying for attention. Officials in Alaska and Pennsylvania note that so far in their states, they have not been able to verify any of Barbara's claims. It's, it's an odd story, actually, because uh, um, usually when, when somebody says they did something like this, uh, you can find some little bit more evidence. False confessors look a lot like serial killers because huh. they share the same motivation. They want to feel powerful and in charge and like big. Both Miranda and Elliot pleaded not guilty to first degree murder charges that carried the ultimate sentence. They later pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of second degree murder and were sentenced to life in prison without parole accused of killing her grandparents inside their Gwinnett County home faced a judge for the first time. She and another teenager are charged with murder. 17-year-old Cassandra B. George was sick of her grandparents, and they were always scolding her and wouldn't let her do whatever she wanted. So one day, she and her 19-year-old boyfriend, Johnny Ryder, came up with a sick plan. On April 8, 2017, 63-year-olds Wendy and Randall B. George were found brutally murdered in their home in Gwinnett County, Georgia. Police made this grim discovery after relatives called asking for a wellness check to be done. A medical examiner ruled the deaths as a homicide, saying that both victims had died as a result of an incision to the throat. They had also suffered blunt force trauma and jab wounds. Evidence at the scene led the police to suspect that Cassandra and Johnny were behind the murders. An arrest warrant was issued for the pair. Police eventually caught up with the suspects at an apartment complex in Swanee, but they would not go down easily and attempted to end their lives. However, police got to them on time and they were rushed to the hospital for treatment before being taken in for questioning. In the interrogation room, officers tried to make Cassandra feel as comfortable, giving her food and drinks and even joking with her. So when they started asking tough questions, Cassandra was very cooperative because she felt like she was just chatting with friends. They began by asking her about her relationship with Johnny. Your boyfriend, Johnny, mm -hmm. how long you date that dude for? Like three months. Three months. Were you guys, you, you and Johnny pretty tight? Did you have feelings for him or just kind of a boyfriend type thing? Or? I had feelings. Yeah. I still have feelings for him. Oh, I, gotcha. I care about him. And he said like ever since then, like it was like love at first sight or something. That's cute though. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> he got married to like this crazy and now, now she's like saying that I'm stalking her when I've only met the girl like twice. Cassandra had a troubled childhood that led to her developing some behavioral issues. Her grandparents got custody of her in 2016, hoping to give her some sort of stability and take her away from the destructive environment at home. They enrolled her at Peachtree Ridge High School, but Cassandra dropped out and went back to her bad behavior. Police records show that between October 2015 to March 2017, they responded to the B. George home 31 times for various reasons, 18 of which were runaway calls. They were also called for domestic disputes and illegal substance use. In one incident in 2016, police were called after Cassandra reportedly assaulted her grandmother. Wendy told the responding officer that she and Cassandra were arguing about her granddaughter's behavior, which included staying out late and being disrespectful, and that during the altercation, Cassandra threw water at her. The officer later noted in his report that during his interview with Wendy, Cassandra was very disrespectful and kept interrupting her grandmother. I guess let's start from scratch uh, about what happened, starting from when you ran away, I guess. Is that the 31st? Do you remember? Or 28th or something like that? I don't really. Was it? I didn't really run away. My grandma like, kicked me out. I was chill with Johnny and my other friend Sabrina, and I came home because you know it was time for curfew because I didn't want to violate my probation. So I came home, and my grandpa was asleep, and my grandma got really mad at me, and she was like saying like, "Oh, you know, if you don't like it here, you know, we're just gonna find somewhere else for you to stay." And she just said that out of the blue, like she just got really mad for some reason. And so I was just like, if you're going to find another place for me to stay, I'm just going to leave. I'm just going to find somewhere else to go. So. And this was basically when you took off, you came back, your grandparents were home. And I guess that's when you had that argument. Cassandra told detectives that days before the murders, she got into another fight with her grandma after she came home late from hanging with friends. Her grandma kicked her out and she went to live with Johnny in his car. 
where they engaged in underage drinking and smoked. It was then that Johnny brought up the idea of killing her grandparents. I don't really remember, like, I, I didn't really even know, like, what day it was mm -hmm. that we went into the house. And before he did that, did you and Johnny meet up somewhere at we, a park or something yeah. to talk about we went what was to, going on? We went to Peace Ridge Park and we talked about it. At first, it wasn't my idea at first. Mm -hmm. um, How did he even get, I guess, what was said? How did he even bring up? What was the context? He first asked me, are you afraid to die? Mm -hmm. And I said, no. And then I asked him, are you afraid to die? And he said, no. He asked me, he was like, would you kill your grandparents? And I kind of like hesitated for a minute. And I was like, why? And he was just like, I don't know. I mean, cause I, he knows probably everything that I've been through with all of my family. And he understands that, you know, like all I really wanted to do was just kind of get away from everything. Kind of just move on with myself. Like I wasn't having a good relationship with my grandparents. Like it just, it started getting really bad, you know, like that I got a charge from him because, you know, like, I fought them, you know. I might have broken, like, my grandpa's ribs when, you know, for that charge for simple assault mm -hmm. and simple battery, you know. And it just, like, it just got really worse. We just kept arguing all the time, and then, I don't know, I guess things, like, just seemed different. They didn't look at me the same anymore. Cassandra's reasoning is really chilling. So because she and her grandparents were no longer getting along, she thought it was okay to take their lives? How messed up is that? When you guys met at the park, did he, did he ever go over the actual plan on how you guys would do it or anything like that? Or mm -hmm. like what was that about? Uh, uh, well, <clears throat> I mean, we were just trying to figure out how to get money and because he said that he might've had a warrant and I didn't know if I had a warrant because you know, my grandma kicked me out, and then that's she did the same thing that my mom did. Like, my mom would kick me out, and like a couple days later, she would call the cops saying that I ran away when I didn't. We decided, like, you know, we would park down the road, and then the park was literally like right behind my backyard, like the neighborhood park. So I was able to go through the park and then cut through my backyard because there was a fence. Like there was the trees, then there was my fence, and then there was the house. Mm -hmm. So you could easily like go through the trees and then there was the little gate that you could go through. On the night of the murder, the pair waited outside the grandparents' home until the lights were turned off. Then they snuck through the back door and found the grandparents sleeping upstairs. So when you guys made it to the, I guess the back door or the back gate, mm -hmm. what'd you guys do next? How'd you move up to the house? Well. We went up the stairs. To, the decking stairs? Yeah, okay. the back deck. And my grandma was still up because we got there a little bit early. So we went back down and we were kind of just chilling over where... Um, the shed is? Yeah, we were just chilling by the shed. Mm -hmm. And then we saw that the lights turned out and then we just like stayed outside for a little bit longer just to, you know, wait. And then I already had the keys to my house because... I already had a set of keys, so I was able to unlock the back door. Cassandra told detectives that when she saw Johnny attacking her grandfather, she felt a surge of energy and dragged her duct-taped grandmother into the bathroom and began attacking her with a tire iron. Do you hear kind of what's going on over there? Yeah. And does that kind of cue you off to mm -hmm. with your grandmother there? Yeah, he's, he started going at it. And then, you know, I could hear my grandpa just yelling, you know, them fighting and then I started getting the rush and then, you know, like, that's when I started hitting my grandma. She started like screaming and stuff and... Yeah. Was that the first hit? Yeah. The back of the head? Yeah. She oh. bit me. These two heartless monsters then made the older couple give them the password to their safe where they collected around a thousand dollars. My grandma, it was kind of weird. Like she was kind of giving me like an idea about it before. Like she was saying, what if I just gave you a thousand dollars? Would that just make the world a better place? I'm just like, no, I don't want a thousand dollars, you know? So, you know, she kept saying that. And then like, when I saw it, I was just like, wow, she actually had a thousand dollars in her safe. Like, that's she crazy. But even after getting what they wanted, they went ahead to mercilessly take the grandparents' lives. Yeah, I go back into the room and I tell them that I got the stuff. And so after that, and then we drag my grandma into the bathroom and 
<clears throat> what was the reason for that? Just to bring her to the bathroom? Yeah, I don't know why we brought her back into the bathroom. I guess we didn't want to bring her into the bedroom. Okay. So we just brought her into the bathroom. Um, and then, yeah, and then Johnny, And and she it was it was kind of creepy because she was like scared uh -huh. to die. Like, she she herself, herself. Oh, did she? It was kind of gross. But it gets worse. After killing her grandmother in cold, Cassandra dragged her body back to the bedroom and then sealed the windows and doors with caulk, apparently to keep the smell of their decomposing bodies from seeping out. Then she and her sicko boyfriend went on to order takeout and invite some friends over for a party. Police said that the older couple had been dead for about a week before their bodies were found. That's pretty messed up, but there's more. Apparently these sickos planned to kill even more family members. That's why, that's the reason why he asked me if I wanted to kill my grandparents, because he wanted to already kill his family. And he was like, to be Bonnie and Clyde. They had even planned to kill Cassandra's mother. Cassandra Bjorga and Johnny Ryder won't be eligible for parole for at least 60 years. The two of them will be almost 80 years old by then. The now 16-year-old girl is currently in close custody at the Alberta Hospital in Edmonton. In order to begin her reintegration, her treatment team and her lawyers say she needs more exposure to the outside world. On April 23, 2006, the residents of a small town called Medicine Hat in Alberta, Canada, woke up to some shocking news about three family members found murdered in their home. The bodies of 42-year-old Mark Richard and his 48-year-old wife, Deborah, were found in the basement of their home while their eight-year-old son, Tyler Jacob, was discovered upstairs. During the investigation, police found that Jasmine's mother, Deborah, was the first to be killed and had been knived at least a dozen times. Mark fought back with a screwdriver, but he was also jabbed to death. Jasmine's little brother was killed with a knife through the neck, but someone was missing the couple's 12-year-old daughter, Jasmine. Police feared that she might have also been a victim and was laying somewhere dead, or she might have been kidnapped. But nothing could have been further from the truth. Jasmine was found the next day, 81 miles away from home. But she wasn't alone. She was accompanied by her 23-year-old boyfriend, Jeremy Allen Steinke. Yeah, you heard me right. This little girl, who was barely a teenager, was dating a full-grown man almost twice her age. But that's not even the shocking part. The community was horrified when they learned that the 12-year-old girl was involved in her family murders. So what really happened? Jasmine had a normal, happy childhood with loving parents who wanted the best for her. She was said to be a very happy and social girl. That is until she met 23-year-old Jeremy Steinke at a punk rock show when she was just 11 years old. Jasmine was already fascinated with the goth lifestyle and had started wearing dark makeup to appear older than she was. She was also becoming a member of the website vampirefreaks.com. Jeremy, on the other hand, had a troubled childhood with an alcoholic mother and a stepdad. He had also faced bullying at school and had attempted to take his own life. By the time he met Jasmine, he had developed an elaborate goth persona, claiming to be a 300-year-old werewolf and wearing a small vial of blood around his neck. He also had an account at the vampirefreaks.com website. Jasmine was really taken by him. They communicated through a popular Canadian social media website called Nexopia. Under the name Runaway Devil, Jasmine falsely claimed that she was 15 and ended with the text, Welcome to my tragic end. Jasmine's parents were not happy when they found out that their underage daughter was seeing an adult man. They grounded her, hoping to keep her away from Jeremy. But the two were in love and would not let Jasmine's parents come between them. On April 3rd, 2006, Jeremy wrote this on his blog. Payment. My lover's rents are totally unfair. They say that they really care. They don't know what is going on. They just assume their throats I want to slit. Finally, there shall be silence. Their blood shall be payment. However, according to police reports, it was Jasmine who first proposed the idea of killing her family. She reportedly wrote Jeremy an email saying, I miss you more than killing people. Can we get together and kill people? Rawr. I hate them. So I have this plan. 
It begins with me killing them and ends with me living with you. It's fascinating how often these killers don't think about the consequences of their actions. They always think that they would somehow outsmart the police and get away with their crimes. I don't know if they're delusional or just plain stupid. Anyway, Jeremy was on board with the idea and replied, well, I love your plan, but we need to get a little more creative with like details and stuff. Jasmine had reportedly also told her friends about her plan to kill her parents, but they either didn't believe her or thought she was joking, but she wasn't. Just hours prior to committing the murders, Jeremy and some friends were reportedly watching the 1994 movie, Natural Born Killers, about a young couple who go on a violent killing spree. Jeremy told his friends that he and his girlfriend should go about their plans in a similar manner, but without sparing her little brother. And that's exactly what they did on April 23rd, 2006. After their arrest, Jeremy reportedly told an undercover cop that Natural Born Killer is the greatest love story of all time. He then went ahead to propose to Jasmine and she said yes. Jeremy was found guilty of three counts of first degree murder and sentenced to three life sentences, one for each victim. He will be eligible for parole after serving 25 years. As for Jasmine, because she was so young when she committed the crime, she only got 10 years in prison which is the maximum sentence allowed in Canada for convicts under the age of 14. Her sentence was to be followed by four years in a psychiatric institution and four and a half years under conditional supervision in the community. We have to appreciate, of course, that she's been in custody uh, for four years, and it's a big four years given that she's now 16. And so um, certainly there have been a number of changes, and as the treatment team indicated, uh, she's not in a normal situation, and so she's a very different person now. We all know she'll be out in the community one day, that's inevitable. And what kind of person is she going to be? What kind of adult is she going to be? So those are the types of questions I, I have. Jasmine's sentence ended in 2016, and she was freed of any further court-ordered conditions, restrictions, or supervision. A young Indian student has been killed after an online date went terribly wrong. Around 9 p.m. on July 23, 2018, emergency services in Melbourne, Australia, received a disturbing call. A 19-year-old woman said, I think I killed someone. I didn't want to, but I did. Constable Luke Colcon, who was on the phone line, went straight to the usual scenario. Perhaps she had to take a life in self-defense. He tried to calm the woman down and asked her what happened. She said, he didn't seem scared. I told him. He's on my bed. It feels so good. Luke could not believe what he was hearing. This was a murder confession. He asked the woman, have you actually done that? To which she replied, you never believe me. Why don't you believe me? This was a strange thing for a woman to tell an officer, except Luke thought the voice was familiar too. And when he visited the address, he realized his hunches were right. This was 19 year old Jamie Lee Dolhe. Luke and his team, the Sunbury PD, had been at her address many times. Jamie Lee's neighbors phoned dozens of times to report the noise disturbances and violent outbursts. Jamie Lee was violent and unpredictable, and she had scared her carers from coming home to her anymore. Her increasingly violent crimes were cries for help, but no one was there to help her anymore. She had scared them all into hiding. Now the worst had happened, and Melbourne authorities had to piece her story together. As it goes in cases like this, the only thing we can do is analyze the case and use the story to prevent other similar tragedies from happening. This is the case of Jamie Lee Dolly and Malin Rathod. Officers and paramedics made it to Jamie Lee Sunbury's home within minutes of her call. Jamie let them in, but she was not frantic about the lifeless body of a man on her bed. Instead, she was shouting at the officers, accusing them of never believing her. I told you he was dead. Why don't you believe me? No one had said they didn't believe her. The authorities did, however, come to her home to try and save 25-year-old Mullen Rathid's life and take Jamie Lee into custody. Mullen was rushed to the nearest hospital, and the adult toy tied tightly around his neck was removed. But the following day, Mullen succumbed to his injuries in the hospital. His family was as devastated as they were furious. How could this happen to a kind man who never wished harm to those around him? He had come to Australia to pursue his dreams, believing the country to be a safe place full of opportunities. Instead, it was their worst nightmare. He had moved to Australia from Guruja, India four years ago. He enrolled at Charles Stewart University to pursue a master's degree in accounting. He also worked as a part-time 
delivery driver to support his studies. Every time he spoke to his family, he sounded happy. He was making friends, his professors were supportive, and he was happy to be there. Now he was gone, and they had no idea who could have done this. They had just spoken to Malin earlier that day, and there was nothing that had them believe he was in trouble. His Australian friends also spoke to the authorities and described him as hardworking but humble and an easygoing man. He made no enemies. He was funny, kind, and generous. He was a very humble personality, uh, very jolly nature. He used to crack jokes, and he loved to play cr cricket. All his loved ones wanted answers, and so did the Melbourne authorities. When Jamie Lee was arrested, her phone was confiscated, and the detectives looked through her most recent activity. Just that day, July 23rd, 2018, she had logged onto a dating app called Plenty of Fish and matched with Malin. Her Plenty of Fish bio read, Borderline Personality Disorder and Idle Tendencies, Into Extreme Fetishes, Vampire Fantasies, biting people and being against my will. It's safe to say Jamie Lee's bio was not particularly inviting. If anything, it was quite disturbing and it sounded like she needed help more than a date. But dating apps are not generally places where people look for psychiatric help. And when Malin stumbled upon her profile, he thought this was a good enough match for the night. He'd worry about her bio later. At around 7 p.m., the two exchanged six explicit messages. Mullen concluded with, we'll do whatever you want. Shortly after 8 p.m., Mullen arrived at Jamie Lee's home. The two had a drink, and then Jamie said she would go to her bedroom to put on her favorite costume and perfume. She would make this a night to remember, but not in the way Mullen or anyone expected. The authorities didn't just have Jamie Lee's phone to go through. They had Jamie herself inside an interrogation room. Their question for her was simple enough. Why on earth did you take this man's life? Jamie Lee simply responded that she was having a bad day. So after she matched with Malin on the dating app, she decided he was going to be her first prey. She was telling the truth. When investigators went through her computer, they discovered a series of Google searches she had made shortly after inviting Malin over. Here are some of them. I'm going to kill someone tonight for fun. I'm going to kill someone tonight, help. 10 steps to committing a murder and getting away with it. Jamie Lee said that when Malin arrived at her address, she was even more confident she could do it. He was small enough for her to be able to outpower him. But she didn't describe him as small, she used the word weak. Then Jamie Lee said she invited Ma Lin to a bit of role play. It was of course a ruse, and Jamie Lee was surprised at how easygoing he was. No matter how threatening her role play got, he would not say no. Jamie Lee was making it sound as though she tried to warn him, so it was his fault that he stayed. Of course the detectives knew better than to believe this point of view. So when they pressed her for more details, she confessed she told Ma Lin that he could just tap her if he wanted it all to stop. However, she never planned on respecting that rule. And within seconds of her disturbing game, she strangled Malin with a toy. While he tapped her desperately and tried to escape her grip, she whispered in his ear, it'll be okay, it'll all be over. The detective clarified it one last time with Jamie when he asked her what was the intention. She simply replied, murder. A young Indian student has been killed after an online date went terribly wrong. The victim has been identified as Morlan Rathod, a 25-year-old accountant living here in Melbourne on a student visa. He died in Sunshine Hospital overnight after being found critically injured on Monday night. He'd gone to a house in Sunbury to visit a 19-year-old woman who lived alone at the address. The visit arranged through an internet dating site. The woman's home was a supported residential service, visited frequently by carers, and neighbours told me this afternoon that police too were frequent visitors to the address to quell noisy and sometimes violent disturbances there. Yeah, this is a twist that makes this case all the more tragic. For years, Jamie Lee Dolhe was a troublemaker with a really disturbed mind who needed all the help she could get. She had lived under the state's care since she was 10 years old, and until she turned 18, she had carers living with her 24-7. That is, when she wasn't in juvenile prison. Indeed, Jamie Lee had a criminal record since her early teens. Almost everything she did, she did against the authorities' advice. Sadly, Jamie Lee's story is not unique. 
children without a steady family, sent from one broken home to another, or kept in the foster system for years, have a higher tendency to end up with a criminal record. Foster children grow up in uncertainty. Some have a lingering feeling that their families abandoned them willingly. Willingly or not, this can cause lifelong abandonment anxieties. Also, the lack of a permanent home and foster care drift is deeply frustrating to a developing child who must find their identity without roots and stability. Finding one's identity as a teen or a young adult happens much more easily when there's a stable base of security and self-confidence. Detachment and the destruction of the capacity for intimacy are not the only results of long stays in foster care. Frustration can lead to aggression. An unstable childhood generates a deep-seated and often subconscious anger. While childhood anger can be addressed and socialized in a proper setting, left untreated, it might flare up later on. And in Jamie Lee's case, it flared up bit by bit until her social carers did not know what to do. After her horrific crime made headlines everywhere, one of her carers described her as a shape-shifting demon girl. This would go hand in hand with what Jamie herself had told detectives inside the interrogation room. She said she had two sides, one nice, one bad, and they always lived together. Like in many other tragic true crime cases, the investigation revealed that as much as Jamie Lee was a monster, she was also failed by the system, which did not offer the help she had needed for so long. Several of her former carers confessed to being scared of her. She was unpredictable, manipulative, and even violent. She would go from zero to 100 within the blink of an eye, and the carers felt unprepared to deal with her. Perhaps Jamie Lee was telling the truth in her Plenty of Fish bio. What the carers described fits well within the borderline personality disorder symptom chart. Unstable, intense relationships, strong fear of abandonment, rapid mood changes, impulsive and dangerous behavior, self paranoia, and anger management issues. Remember Jamie's rant at the constable and authorities on the day of her arrest? She would accuse them of not believing her. That was her problem. Not that she had just taken an innocent life. What she said during her 000 call on July 23rd also confirmed this. Her state of mind was chaotic. She told the constable that she thought it felt good to take Mullen's life. But within the same minute, she said she did not want to be a killer. Supreme Court Justice Peter Almond would tell Jamie Lee he believes she took Mullen's life because, yet again, she felt she was not being taken seriously. That's because when she told Mullen about all the mean things she could do to him, he said it was all fine. It was role play after all. Jamie Lee posted a lot on social media. Some posts were just photos of herself with various filters or makeup. Others were accompanied by text, and some of them were truly disturbing. Here's a post that Jamie Lee wrote about her childhood. Jamie Lee wrote on her social media that she had suffered all kinds of a the hands of her family. In a way, being sent to the foster system was a blessing. But the fact that her family abandoned her never stopped tormenting her. She wrote this on May 20th, 2018. Two months later, she would take Malin's life inside her home. On May 21st, she also wrote a post raising awareness about CA and warning parents who behave in this monstrous way with their children. She would inflict unspeakable damage on herself as this is how she felt. She did not know what else to do. Jamie had also said she felt she had a demon inside of her fighting to come outside and take control of her body. One of Jamie Lee's friends spoke to the detectives too. She said her two-faced description of herself was true. One minute the friend said Jamie would be smiling and cracking jokes. The next, she would literally growl like a wolf. A few days before taking Mullen's life, Jamie Lee posted one more photo of herself, this time on Facebook. On July 23rd, the day she took Mullen's life, she texted one of her carers. She said, I feel really sick with bad temptations. I want to call the police, but they won't believe me. I want to cry. There were several red flags around Jamie Lee. Her mental health was deteriorating by the week, and she openly admitted to finding happiness in watching others suffer. She was on a path from self-destruction to destruction. Yet, no one realized they had to take more drastic measures to prevent Jamie Lee from hurting others. Jamie Lee Dolehy's case is a complicated one. The authorities couldn't blame her carers, after all, she had not warned anyone that she would take a life. And you can't have someone arrested over a hunch. Could someone have had Jamie Lee committed to a psychiatric hospital? Perhaps, but it's always clearer in hindsight. Jamie Lee herself could not be fully blamed for what she did. 
as outrageous as it might sound. After her arrest, her mental health was assessed by some of the most renowned psychiatrists in Australia. They all reached the same conclusion. She was one of the most psychologically damaged patients they had ever come across. In simple words, this means that Jamie Lee was not fully in control of her actions when she unalived Malin. So she couldn't face the same degree of penalty as someone declared sane after a psychiatric evaluation. During her first court appearance, Jamie Lee was jolly. She showed her self-proclaimed nice side to authorities and journalists. Shockingly, she entered a plea of not guilty. For 12 months, Jamie Lee was assessed again, interviewed, and interrogated with one purpose, to determine if she was fit to stand trial. By the autumn of 2019, it was concluded that she was. Her trial balanced two opposing perspectives. According to the prosecution, Jamie Lee was more than open about her intent to unalive Malin Rathod. After all, she had told detectives right after her arrest that she decided she would take his life as soon as they matched on the dating app. And when she saw him, she knew he was quote unquote weak enough to be outpowered by her. What more than this confession could the jury want? Prosecutor Patrick Bork said, She deliberately strangled him, ignored his tapping, the panic symbol, until he became a dead weight. However, Jamie Lee's attorney, Sharon Lacey, went with another point of view. Jamie Lee was an extremely troubled young woman with a history of CA, SA, and severely disturbed childhood. Sharon also said that Jamie Lee suffered from stunted psychological development as a result of all the trauma. While nothing excuses taking a life, Jamie Lee's mental state at the time of the slaying goes to explain why she could only be convicted of manslaughter, a lesser charge for a person who is not in control of their actions. The prosecution, however, brought a psychiatrist who made a strong statement. He said that while Jamie Lee did suffer from a slew of mental illnesses, she did not suffer from psychosis. This meant that she knew what she did was wrong. While this was happening, Jamie Lee was drawing in a kid's coloring book and making origami. She did not appear to listen to what was going on around her, nor did she make eye contact with anyone in the courtroom. Every now and then, she smiled or laughed, often inappropriately. This only went to confirm Sharon's theory. Then there was also testimony confirming Jamie Lee thought of herself as a werewolf. Other times she was convinced her actions were controlled by an evil demon inside her. By New Year's 2020, there was a bit of shocking news making headlines all over Australia. A Sunbury woman who choked an Indian university student to death only hours after meeting him on a dating app has been acquitted of murder. Jamie Lee Dolagai admitted she felt good after her victim, but a jury found she did not intend to kill him. Hours before Jamie Lee Dolagai lured her prey into her bedroom, the woman who once believed she was a werewolf searched online, 10 steps to commit a murder and get away with it. Jamie Lee was found not guilty of murder by reason of insanity. However, her confession and mountains of evidence could not have Jamie back out on the streets. She was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to nine years in prison. Before her conviction, she said, I felt good for some reason because I've suffered so much in my life that I feel like I'm taking back what was once rightfully mine. She also stated that she wishes Malin would have escaped her grip and phoned authorities before she could take his life. During the trial, Dolagai smiled to herself as she drew pictures using colored pencils. Today, however, she simply stared at the floor. Her lawyers say they need until April next year to compile all of her psychiatric reports. Judge Peter Almond told Jamie Lee, You took the life of a young person who had done nothing to harm or provoke you. He was totally trusting and unsuspecting. Speaking of Mullen's parents, they could not afford to travel to Australia for the trial. Mullen was their only child, yet they could not do anything to save his life or push for a tougher punishment for Jamie Lee. Mullen's friends raised money to send his body over to Gerjot, where he was buried 12 days after his death. His family is still struggling to cope with the loss. It's a hole in their hearts that will never be filled. And the fact that Jamie Lee might spend just over three years in prison will haunt them just as much. Wait, what? Yeah, not only was she sentenced to only nine years behind bars, but she can be out any time now as a part of an early release program. 
Her parole was set as five and a half years from her conviction in October 2020. However, as she had already spent two years in prison awaiting trial, as of April 2024, her parole date has already arrived. She could be out tomorrow. Even some of her former carers had advised the judge not to. They recommended that they keep Jamie Lee in prison for the rest of her life. In their eyes, she was simply too big a threat to other people to be let go. And the latest news confirms she is not rehabilitated. Jamie Lee Dolligai still has homicidal urges and she has threatened to kill another inmate. For now, she remains locked up in maximum security. This begs the question, with Jamie's history of mental illness and trauma, can she ever be rehabilitated? And when she is released from prison, what will the state do to ensure she is on a path to rehabilitation and those around her are safe? Hey, thanks for watching. How do you think Jamie Lee's case should be handled? What should states do to ensure the fair treatment of troubled individuals while bringing justice to their victims? Let me know your take on things in a comment. And before you leave, you know the drill. Like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you next time.